this manner, pray ye. Read with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Pray. And I hope that's been our prayer. Lord, teach us how to pray. We want to know, how do we, how do we pray? And, and our, our focus has been on praying in such a way that honors God. And this, this is so important because so much of what we do in worship, we think in terms of we're coming to worship to feed us or to help us or to, you know, we, we sing a song and we judge that song by, do I like that song? Do I not like that song? Do I, you know, or we, uh, we listen to a message, do I like that message? Do I not like that message? I mean, it all becomes about us. It's not about us. It's about our eyes being lifted up to our good, good Father. And, and, and worshiping Him. And when we pray, we want to pray in a way that honors Him. We, I mean, we, I don't know about you, but I so easily stray in my mind toward me. I so much need to focus my attention on Him. And when I do, when I do, I mean, He is the one who gives us this day our daily bread after all, right? He is the one who leads us in good paths. He is the, I mean, He is all of that. But when I focus on Him then, and I seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these other things fall in place. Amen? Amen. And that's what our focus has been on. And I'm not going to retrace our steps through the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be focusing on that in just a few moments. But I do want to focus our attention on what is called the doxology of the Lord's Prayer. And, and, and that is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And what I want us to see this morning, I want us to acknowledge that our Father is the King over all and worthy of all glory and all our praise. Now, if you're filling in the blanks there, I'm going to give you a minute because I know that's a lot of words. Our acknowledge that our Father is King over all and is worthy of all glory and all our praise. These words are an echo from 1 Chronicles chapter 29 when David gathered with the people as he was helping the people and preparing the people to build the temple that would be built, not in his lifetime, but by his son Solomon. And David said, and it says this in 1 Chronicles 29, Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, is, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth are yours. Yours is the kingdom, O, God, o Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank You, our God, and we praise Your glorious name. Isn't it amazing how those words from the Lord's Prayer as we pray it, as we so often pray it, are just an, an echo to much of the other, of many other Scriptures in the Bible, in 1 Chronicles 29 especially. Now, I want us to, we're, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. I, I, I don't think I've ever preached a sermon exactly like this one in the almost 40 years that I've, I've been a pastor. But it, here, here's where we're going. Our confidence in the love and care and greatness of our Father and our King is enhanced. I want us to see that. can be enhanced as we think through why this phrase... For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever is not is in the King James Version of the Bible, but is not in many of the newer translations. And some of you have noticed that, and you've asked me, you know, that when we've been reading in these these, these newer translations, that's not there. Why is it not there? And, and some of us, if we're not careful, we could be knocked off our props a little bit 
knocked off our foundation a little bit because it's not there. And we start asking some questions. And I hope maybe we can answer those questions as we look through this today. Why is this phrase not in the newer versions? And, and, and well, the simple answer and the short answer is it is not in the oldest and best manuscripts that we have of the Bible. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that a little bit further as we go along. The, the Bible was passed down through us, to us through manuscripts, as we call them, or copies. We do not have the original manuscripts of the Bible. And, and, and so someone might say, well, if, because it's, not, it's in the King James, but it's not in the newer translations and somebody changed it, does that mean we're just in a habit of changing our Bibles? And does that mean that we really can't trust in the accuracy of, of the, the Bibles that we hold in our hand? I mean, is it a, just a moving target? Is it something we should be upset about or knocked off our foundation by? And the fact is, I think instead, we, our foundation should be made even stronger because it's not in the newer translations, but it's in the King James Version of the Bible. And I think we can see that our God loves us and that He cares for us and that He has passed His Word down to us through the ages and it is passed down to us in a very, very accurate form. So, now, now, and what I want you to understand is that when you think about manuscripts, now stay with me here. Some of you are going to zone out because this, you know, we talk about numbers and that's going to, you're going to get lost. But, but we have about 5,800 pieces or whole manuscripts of the New Testament. So that means we have lots of manuscripts of the book of Matthew, for example. That is an unprecedented number of manuscripts of any ancient document that has been passed down through the ages. 5,800. And, 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 and we have less than 50 manuscripts of the writings of Aristotle. Or, or we have about 700 manuscripts of Homer's Iliad, which was actually written in the Greek language that the New Testament was, was written down in at the very beginning. Now, and, and what we would say is that because we have 700 copies, not the original language, not, or not the original manuscripts, not the original copies, but we have 700 copies of Homer's Iliad, we would say that because we have that many, that we can be about 95% sure that what we have is accurate. That it is accurate to the original writings of Homer. Are you with me? I'll explain it to you in a little more in just a minute. Stay with me. We have 5,800 copies or pieces of copies of the New Testament. Unprecedented. And because we have that many, we can be to right at 100% sure that everything that we have that has been passed down to us is accurate to the original manuscripts. So if you have a, someone that you meet somewhere and they say, and they, 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 they question your faith and your Christianity, and they say, well, you don't even have the original manuscripts. Essentially, yes, we do. We don't have the, the exact pieces of papyrus as, as they were copied on. They, they were the tree that the leaves were taken from, and they copied them down on it. They didn't have printing presses. Everybody remember your Western civilization, I hope. They didn't have, they, 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 they copied them down. They were copied down by hand. And yes, sometimes there were mistakes made. Sometimes a word might be written twice. Anybody ever done that? I was typing something the other day and I, it said and, and, because I got distracted and not and, but and, and. Well, they didn't have spell check or grammar check back then either. That, I mean, my grammar check things, just the lights are going off, you know, and I look at it, I say, okay, I did that twice. And, and so I go back and I change it. Well, they didn't have that, and it was very tedious. The whole process was very tedious. They didn't have the modern paper we have, nor the, the writing utensils that we might use today. Even if they're writing it out, they didn't have all of that. 
And so they would write it down. Sometimes there would be a misspelling. I mean, God used a human process here. And sometimes words were duplicated, and sometimes, and, and there were other things that, that happened in the process. But when you take 5,800 copies and you set them side by side, what you begin to realize, what you begin to find out, is that we have the, an accurate. We what we have is accurate to the the ancient manuscripts. The, the, the things that Paul actually sent to, the letters that Paul actually sent to the church at Corinth or to Ephesus, the actual writings of Matthew when he wrote the gospel that we call Matthew, we don't have those original manuscripts, but what we have, we can have confidence that our God in His goodness and His love for us has not only given us His Word, but He's given us an accurate accounting of His Word in this thing that we call the book. That's what Bible means. The book. Capital T-H-E. Book. That it is accurate. And that we can be confident. And the, and the Greek New Testament used by the translators of the King James... Now here we get, some, some of you are going to get under your skin because I know you grew up on the King James and so did I. I memorized lots of verses of the King James growing up. But the manuscripts that we have from the King James Version, what we have discovered since the writing of the King James Version, or the translating of the King James Version, which was translated from Greek into English 400 years ago, it's called the Authorized Version, it was, it was published in 1611. This was after the printing press. Authorized by King James the first, called the Authorized Version, or as we know it, the King James Version. The manuscripts that we have from which that was translated are not the oldest and best manuscripts that we have. In fact, there were, were only a handful of manuscripts that were used by the translators of the King James, even because they didn't, they didn't have everything pulled together in one place like we do today. They didn't have computer programs like we do today to be able to set these things down and look at them side by side by side. And so, the, the, if you look at, uh, this is a, an ESV, English Standard Version, I use it primarily because it is a word-for-word -word translation. By that, it is very accurate to the words that are as they are actually written in the Greek language. You're, if you have an NIV, it is more a word-for-thought translation. I hope you get that. So they wrote down, they, they looked at the, the language and they wrote down the thoughts and sometimes it's very, very literal, but sometimes it is more elaborated on in the thought process to help us to better understand that in the English. Don't let any of that disturb you, because here's the thing. This tells us that God, in His grace and in His goodness and in His love for you and for me, has given us and made available to us an accurate accounting of the Word. And all of this, and study it if you will, I encourage you to do that, all of this is, is, was an elaborate process through the years that the church went through to decide which books go in here and which books don't. But also this process of writing down, writing down and making sure that the copies are accurate. And, and so the oldest, but the oldest and best manuscripts were not used when the King James was printed. Now, does that mean the King James is not a good version? Absolutely not. In fact, no meaning of anything has changed from the King James to our more modern translations. What you will find is that the those that phrase, "Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, amen, is in brackets in your translation. Somebody take out your Bible, you if you haven't, uh, or, or it will be in the footnotes because it was so much a part of our language. They, they, they left it in there, but they did not necessarily put it directly in the text because in, in seeking to be accurate to the oldest and best manuscripts that were available, that phrase 
was not in there. Do you see that? So, I mean, it, it is a good, it is, it is, I think we can say from Matthew and Luke, that, that from, from what we have in Matthew and Luke, that Jesus probably didn't, in teaching his followers to pray in his prayer, he didn't say those words. Or at least Matthew didn't record those words. Now, does that upset anybody? It's okay if it does. But just look at the facts. No, we're, we're a reasonable people. We are not just a people who feel our faith. Do you understand that? What we're getting at here, and, and what we find is that, that, uh, that science is our friend. And what is discovered down through the ages doesn't disprove the Word of God, but more and more proves the Word of God. And in all of this, our Father, who is King over all, shows His great love for us in the preservation of His Word. And in, in, in Isaiah chapter 40, we read, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. And that is not just a, a, a word that is kind of a, a, an ephemeral word out there somewhere. It is a written down word. Do you understand that? God made His Word available to us. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God stands forever. That God will do what He says He will do. That the promises of God can be counted on. And that He will preserve His Word. And listen folks, and I think we're accountable for this, we have more, we have the, the scriptures available to us now more than any other generation of any other time. And God in His grace and goodness has given us this. I mean, I, I, I've got a, a copy of, I, on my phone. Tra all kinds of translations, right? I can, I can dial up right now. I can go in, push a couple of buttons. I've got it on my phone. I, on, on this tablet, I've, I've got the, the, the whole Bible. I've got it in multiple translations right, right here available to me. And, and God in His goodness has made that available to us. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Listen, in, a, in, a, in an age of skepticism, in an age of secularism, where more and more the thought, if not if it's not said out loud, it's the thought process of our time that we have outgrown God and that we don't really need God anymore, we don't really need the Bible, that we have science and we have all of these other things available to us and, and we've outgrown that as a people. What, what, what is said here is absolutely essential. The, the flowers fade and the grass withers, but the Word of God... And, the Word of God alone will stand forever. And when time, when, when time as we know it is extinguished, and time as it has been promised to us lights up all of creation and all that God has made in heaven and on earth, the Word of God will still stand. And we can have that confidence today. And we, and we need to live in that confidence. The Apostle Paul wrote, the, wrote this, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. It was written. Do you see that? It was written down. It was written for our instruction through, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. We are not just a, creep, a, group of, a, a bunch of creatures that are cast to the wind. We... We, we're born and we die if, if, if somebody lets us be born. Yeah. And, 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 we, and we die and we die and, the, and, and, and God has... And, and, all, and that's it. No, we are a people. We are, we are creatures that were created in the image of God. And, and we know that from this. And we were created for His glory and for His purposes, not our own. And though we rebelled against Him and we turned away from Him and, and our spirit was extinguished in the fall, it, it is awakened in Christ who died for us and who rose again from the grave. We are a resurrection people. And how do we know that? This book. I mean, you, don't, you can't sit out under a tree and just know that. 
I mean, you look up at the tree, and the tree's amazing. But you can't, and just the intricacy of that tree is amazing, but you can't know that just sitting under a tree or sitting on a mountain as beautiful as the scenery might be. You can't know that. How do you know that? Because God in His goodness has passed down to us this book that we call the Bible. And so we understand, we see the New Testament as a reliable historical source by which we come to know Jesus Christ and the Gospel that He came to bring us. Do you see that? And, and, and our, our faith is enhanced as we see the process by which all of this came to us. I, I gave you some... I gave you some resources there to turn to in the handout. They're written down, and I think they might be on the screen. Just some, There's an online resource. There are a couple of books. There's a book by Josh McDowell. There's a book by, uh, by uh, Greg Gilbert. I know our young people, our teenagers are studying that. But those who come to the discipleship groups at 5 o'clock, right? And, and, and they're studying that with their discipleship leaders, their mentors on Wednesday evening. And they're walking through this book by Greg Gilbert called Why Trust the Bible. There are all kinds of resources that can tell you more about what I'm talking about here than I'm going to have time to talk with you about today. But here's the thing. We see that science has only confirmed the validity of the biblical records. Places that they once said that was a mythological place. I mean, they, they say for, for years there have been those that have argued that Sodom and Gomorrah was just a story. And just a, a nice story, a mythological story. Guess what they found not too many years ago? It was actually washed up under the Dead Sea. They found Sodom and Gomorrah. They found this incinerated place called, called Sodom there. Play, people groups like the Hittites that they said were, were a, a, a contrived people. They, they found record of the Hittites in archaeology. Archaeology is a science. And the science and science hasn't disproved what we believe. Science has proven all the more what we believe. Science of every kind, every, of every genre of science has only served to believe validate what we say we believe. We don't need that. We have the Word of God. But the two do not conflict with one another, but instead they, they reinforce one another. The heavens declare the glory of God. Hallelujah. And when we, and when we look up and when we look around and when we look at, at, at just our, our own, the, the, these created bodies, when we sit out under a tree, what do we see? We just see validated who our God is, His grace, His goodness, His greatness, that His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It is true, isn't it? And we see that, and we see that all around us. And we see that although we do not have the original manuscripts of the New Testament writings, we have so many manuscripts that can verify the accuracy of what we do have. And so, the fact that this is not in your newer translation, but it's in the King James, don't let that throw you off. But instead, let that just say, help you to say, thank you God that there have been those who have studied I mean, aren't you glad for scholars? For, for years in the church, I heard people say, oh, that's just all those scholars. Put it down. But you know, you probably drove across a bridge today, and that bridge was planned out and constructed by scholars called engineers. And aren't you glad? Aren't you? I never thought I'd say... John, we're so glad that you... No, we... You know, I mean, I, I, I admire that. I respect that. Those are scholars. Those are people who study. And you drove across that bridge and you didn't give it a second thought. But the intricacy of the planning of that bridge and the working through and the history of that. We know this doesn't work well, but we know this works well. And so all that coming together constructed a bridge. 
and all of the coming together of what God has given to us in His Word is the bridge. It's the bridge God has given to us to the knowledge of the Gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ and who He is and who we are as His people. You know, I, if you want to think about the, the manuscripts and just the number of manuscripts, you know, I, I, I thought about this. Let's say for just a minute you have a, a, a recipe passed down from your great-great-grandmother. Okay, you got a, got a recipe. And, and let's just say it's sugar cookies, all right? And there's kind of a family reason for, for that. I would say there, it's a recipe for sugar cookies. It was passed down by your great-great-grandmother. And you've done some studying because, I mean, these sugar cookies are to die for. And, 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 and I know some of you are saying, come on, preacher, get down if you're going to talk about sugar cookies. <laughs> but I mean, let's focus for a minute. You got, and you got 42 copies of the recipe of these sugar cookies from a great, great grandmother. They've been copied by different generations, different people, passed out to this child and that child and the other child. You've got 42 copies. And in five of the copies, you have, it says TBSP on a particular ingredient. But on the other, thir in the, on the other 37 of the copies, it says TSP. What does that stand for? Tablespoon or teaspoon, right? Now, I think that makes quite a difference. But in five of the copies, somebody added a B. Maybe it was the sugar, and they liked sugar. I don't know, but but well, whatever. And now, now you would say, okay, do we can we trust that this is my grandmother's recipe by the 42 copies that we have? By all 42 copies. I think you would be able to say accurately, yes, you've got 37 that verify TSP, teaspoons. And only five say tablespoons. But not only that, the best you can tell by just your own eyesight and by the way it was transmitted, you can tell that, that these that say TSP are some of the oldest copies. And so you don't have the original writing down of the recipe, but you have, 30, you have 42 copies and you set them down side by side by side. And what do you come up with? You come up with five that say TBSP. You say, that's, that's not accurate because these 37 say TSP, teaspoon. And so you say, we got it. We got great, great grandmother's recipe for sugar cookies. Now, I, that's a, a really super simplified version of what happened in the passing down of the manuscripts and, and the determination of what makes the very best manuscripts. A super simplified version. But these are scientists called textual critics. They're not criticizing in the sense of putting something down, but criticizing in the sense of examining. And they examine the copies and they examine the copies. And in this technological age, they can take all of these copies and set them down in one program and they can look at them and they can say, these have such consistency that we know that we have the original words as they were written down in the New Testament. You see where I'm coming from? And because of that, we, you know, but the fact that this is not in this particular version, but is in this version, that, that doesn't knock us off our props. That only serves to enhance our faith. And we see that although we do not have the original manuscripts, the New Testament writings, we have so many manuscripts that we can verify what we do have. And so instead of doubting, we should have complete confidence in the integrity and the reliability of our God and His Word. Hallelujah. I hope when you pick your Bible up in the morning and you begin to, to read a passage of Scripture that you have all the more appreciation for what you hold in your hand that has been passed down to us through the ages and has been, has been poured over. Somebody might make the accusation that we as Christians just accept whatever's handed to us and we don't, we don't uh, 
We don't think it through. We don't reason it through. No, there's been tremendous reasoning over every word and every punctuation mark that you find in this book that we call the Bible. And more than any other document, we have an accurate record of what has been passed down to us. So, we are people who don't sit around and say, oh no, is this accurate? We are people who build our house upon the rock. And we know it's the rock, the Word of God, that has been passed down to us. So, also, why was this phrase, yours the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, added into the text that, that was used to create or to translate the, uh, the King James Version? Well, let me give you some, very quickly some, some reasons. The, one is the Jews practiced the tradition of ending prayer with the doxology. Now, doxology is an interesting word. It's a word that comes from the Greek language. Doxa means glory. And logos, all of G, means what? Word. It's a glory word. This is, I mean, that's the best way to think of this. This is a glory word. And, and the Jews would end their prayers with this, and that was passed down to the early church. And the church began to recite this prayer, and I'm, I believe that it probably in those manuscripts from which the King James was written, those were copied down for, the, for use in worship. So that the people, as they picked up a document, and they were reading it, and they were, they were sharing in the liturgy of the church, they, they came to the end of the Lord's Prayer, they prayed it together, they learned it together, and, and, and a fitting ending for that would be, a thine is the tears of the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so they, they added that in there, Many manuscripts that was in some manuscripts from which the King James was written down, not the best, not the oldest manuscripts, those words were there. And now I, I don't know that, but I, that, that's my that's my best guess. And, and then Jesus likely spoke a glory word when he prayed publicly. But in neither Matthew or Luke do we find these words in the best manuscripts. Does that knock us off our foundation? No. No, it only enhances our trust. There, and, and you know what? I think another reason is because there are doxologies like this one throughout the Bible. They are some of my favorite passages of Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 3, the, in fact, the Apostle Paul had what we would say probably about 20 doxologies in his letters. One of them in Ephesians chapter 3, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's a glory word, folks. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we read, To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a glory word. In my, my favorite, I think, in all the New Testament, Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's a glory word. In Jude, verses 24 and 25, Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present to you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. The Revelation is full of glory words. In in. in the Revelation chapter 1, to Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood and made us a kingdom, priest to His God and Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 5, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might 
forever and forever. Glory words. How many of you grew up singing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. What's the name of that? The doxology. It's a glory word. David, the David Crowder Band has redone this. It's been passed down from generation to generation. It's not in the Scriptures directly, but the truth of it is there all the way through, is it? All the way through. And the truth of thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's all the way through the Scriptures. And as we come before Him and worship Him today, we know He has revealed Himself to us. And He has preserved His Word for us through the ages. That even in places where they have sought to burn it and cast it aside, it is still stands. It is the Word that still stands. That He is our Father in Heaven. That His name is hallowed. And may it be hallowed throughout the earth. That His kingdom will come and His will be done. And one day when a new heaven and a new earth kingdom of God in all of its fullness is going to be revealed to us. We recognize that He is the source of every need of our lives and so we pray, give us this day our daily bread. We, we, we recognize our need for cleansing in our relationship with Him and relationships with one another. And that cleansing has been given to us by His blood. And so we pray, forgive us our debts as we, for, as we have forgiven our debtors. And we realize our need for His protecting hand upon us day in and day out from our enemy. And so we pray, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And it is right that we would say, for thine, for yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever.